All right, I think we can get started now. Thank you everyone for joining uh, the May 2021 edition of RFCs We Love. Uh, before we get started, I will just like to give you a brief introduction about RFCs We Love, uh, not more than a few minutes. So I'm Mohit and uh, once again, I welcome you all uh, for joining this event. So RFCs We Love is an event uh, that is presented by India Internet Engineering Society, IIE SOC. And we have gathered here today for the May 2021 edition. The major focus of this edition is on TLS fingerprinting. Uh, I will also introduce the speakers who have already joined us today. So moving forward, uh, RFCs we love. This is the 22nd meetup and the ninth in fully virtual mode. The past editions of RFCs, we love uh, all the information about YouTube videos and slides and speakers is available on that link. And this is an event which is organized by IIE SOC, as I mentioned. And apart from RFCs, we love, we also have another two things that we work on. Uh, one thing is we also organize an annual pre-ITF forum, which we call it as Connections. And this has been done since 2017. Uh, please feel free to visit this link where you can find more details about the past editions of connections. Besides that, we have an IPv6 webinar series right now, which is uh, being conducted with uh, in collaboration with Industry Network Technology Council, uh, INTC. And this is the link. Uh, so feel free to visit the INTC website. Uh, a quick poll, I'll just launch a quick poll to get uh, the participants information as to uh, how many participants have attended the RFCs we love in the past. So you should be able to see the poll in uh, in your Zoom client. So I'll just wait for about like 10 seconds and then maybe we can proceed. All right. So I think we can get started. Thank you, everyone. Let's proceed. So uh, a brief information about the upcoming events from II, uh, IIE SOC and ITF. So we'll be having the ITF 111 uh, from July 26 to 30th, 2021. It's been announced that it is going to be in fully online mode. The timings are not so suitable for uh, the participants from India, but still uh, we can try our level best to attend some of the important sessions in the area that we are working on. Uh, feel free to register. The registration is already open. And uh, if needed, there are some fee waivers also available. Uh, go check that website and you, you will be able to see a lot of information about it. And in case you need any help with attending ITF, just in case it's, it's your first ITF meeting, you might want to check this edition of RFCs we love about July 2020, for which I have posted the link here, in which we gave introduction to ITF, tips for the first ITF meeting, and how has been the participation from ITF uh, in, from India in ITF and how can we go about increasing the same? Uh, let me talk a minute about IPv6 deployment and training efforts of IIE SOC. Uh, this vision is for a multi-year project and the basic idea is to provide training, is to do a deep dive into the security and application conversion and also help enterprises plan their IPv6 deployment. This work, as I said earlier, is being carried out with support from APNIC and in collaboration with INTC. Uh, all the webinar details, including the past recordings and the PowerPoint presentations with a lot of other material is available on the link, which I have shared here. You can also register for the upcoming uh, webinars. So here is a list of the webinars. You can see uh, the ones in blue are the ones that we have already completed. We have completed till um, May 13, 2021. Uh, one important part about this training is that there is a lab component which includes going into a deep dive for more hands-on experience and learning and the next session is on june 3rd and then the lab session corresponding for the same will be on june 10th uh, we highly encourage you to be a part of these webinars going forward uh, i'll post this information also in the chat box uh, please feel free to use the q a sessions uh, the section for asking questions and uh, we shall take the questions at the end of the presentations. About joining IIE SOC and the information that I have put up on this particular slide, I'll be also putting in the chat box so that everybody can feel free to join from there. Let's get started with our 
current edition that is the TLS fingerprinting edition we have two excellent speakers with us today uh, we have Tirumaleshwar Reddy and Blake Anderson who will be taking us through uh, the TLS fingerprinting basics as well as the details and the kind of the work that they have done getting started with our first speaker for today I would like to give a brief introduction to uh, Tirumaleshwar Reddy so Tiru is a principal engineer at McAfee and he uh, has expertise in network and IoT endpoint security, architecting and developing security products and solutions. He is currently a chair of the TEEP working group at, and a member of the security area review team at IETF. He has co-authored 22 RFCs and is an active contributor in several working groups. He has 47 patents approved and 50 patents filed. His recent work and interest include IoT security, service function chaining, DDoS mitigation, and encrypted DNS. Uh, thanks a lot, Tiru, for joining us today. Over to you. Hey, thanks, Mohit, for the introduction and the talk about the work happening in IPv6. That's really interesting. Uh, let me share the slides. Uh, Can you see the slides? Yes. Hey, hey, hey friends, uh, I'm Thiru. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about TLS fingerprinting and then Blake will uh, uh, discuss and de give a deep dive on the work he's been doing on TLS fingerprinting. I'll, I'll just try to educate on why TLS finger fingerprinting, what's the need for it and why it's drawn uh, a lot of attention, especially from the security providers, right? Uh, as you guys all may be aware, right? I mean, I mean, TLS is one of the most uh, uh, predominantly uh, used protocol by uh, for securing your application data. It's it's used by browsers, operating systems, even IoT devices nowadays, and 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 it's pretty much used by every content provider around the world. And and nowadays, even IoT devices have started using DTLS. DTLS is basically uh, running TLS uh, over UDP, and it's customized to run over UDP. Uh, TLS has been going through various enhancements in the last few years. Um, uh, it started with SSL v3 and now we have TLS 1.3. TLS 1.2 stayed for a very long duration for around a decade. And uh, till, till 2010 to even now, we see several enhancements happening in with, with regard to extensions being supported in TLS 1.2, but uh, TLS 1.2 got adapted last year. And uh, if you see today, browsers already support TLS 1.3 and several content providers are already supporting TLS 1.3 and, and it's gaining traction every day that I see more and more adaptions uh, moving towards TLS 1.3 because of uh, the security performance and other issues that uh, TLS 1.23 tries to fix that are uh, uh, presently uh, not addressed in TLS 1.2. Uh, why TLS fingerprinting, right? I mean, I mean, TLS fingerprinting is more about uh, you you look at the TLS traffic and take some of the data features from TLS. Either it could be the TLS version, the cipher suits that were negotiated, uh, the extensions that were used, signature algorithms that were used, and several of these parameters, and, and you create a fingerprint out of it, right? And and that fingerprint could be used for various purposes. Uh, it could be used, for instance, the one that is predominantly used by security service providers is, hey, use the TLS fingerprint to identify malware. Uh, and the biggest advantage is you can identify the malware without um, decrypting the uh, TLS traffic. Uh, it could also be used for identifying the applications that are being uh, uh, hosted on the endpoint. Uh, it gives you a good visibility into the network traffic, what kind of traffic is being exchanged from the endpoint with, uh, with peers or content providers. Uh, it, it's also used for an interesting other purpose to identify the operating system that is on the endpoint, what kind of uh, device type, make and model, for example, you could identify the IoT device type, uh, uh, its make and, and model of it, and that could be used for solving several uh, uh, security problems. I'll go, and, I'll go into details of each of these and why these are important and how these are being used in today's world. Uh, 
coming to malware right i mean malware is 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 one of the, the biggest reasons why security service providers are interested in using tls fingerprinting and as you see today that uh, it's good that legitimate applications are moving towards HTTPS and you don't see uh, many websites in today's world using uh, HTTP. But at the same time, uh, even malware has uh, adapted TLS as, as a de facto protocol for encrypting its communication. And uh, it becomes a big challenge for middle boxes to identify malware uh, without looking into what, what kind of communication is being exchanged by the uh, malware with the command and control server. Uh, Identifying malware when it's using encrypted communication is quite a challenge for uh, uh, middle boxes, especially in deployments where it's impossible for the deployment to access a TLS proxy. It could be, uh, for example, uh, uh, some security vendor offering uh, home network security, an ISP offering uh, security to mobile devices, uh, uh, or it could be an enterprise BOD or, or an SMB enterprise where it's not possible to act as a TLS proxy and install enterprise root certificates or endpoints. And uh, and the bigger problem with, with regard to malware is malware has, is adapting quite fast and, and your DNS filtering may or may not be able to identify zero day attacks. For example, if the malware is using PGA, PGA is, is, is a very common practice among malware that they keep change, dynamically generating a domain name, which is which is uh, which which keeps changing every few days or it could even change every few hours. And it quite becomes, uh, 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 um, uh, it takes quite some time for a threat reputation database to uh, update its DNS uh, domain name to say that, hey, this is a DGA and detect that and block that. So how do you uh, handle zero day attacks? And uh, that's one of the problems that the industry has been facing that, uh, how do you attack identify new malware where uh, the malware signature may not be available with your IPS, uh, your DNS filtering service may not be aware of the new domain that that's being used by the malware and, and it may not be possible to act as a TLS proxy. And, 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 and the best part is that uh, since TLS is used by both legitimate and malicious flows, uh, TLS can be used for fingerprinting so that you can identify and distinguish whether it's in uh, legitimate app or a malicious, uh, or a malicious app that is running on your endpoint. Uh, identifying applications is also a very important use case that we've been seeing in the last few years. Um, identifying applications solves several problems. If you see, if you see in the last one year i've seen several malicious apps in play store especially on android right and, and google tries to keep removing them but those apps have a very bad intent that either uh, they compromise your security or privacy that they try to read what are you doing in other apps they try to reveal your private in privacy private information or it could be a malicious apk that you could download i've seen this attack especially popular with uh, with the recent pandemic that you get sms saying that hey you download this apk and you can probably get a vaccination at some place, right? And people do that all the time. And that's that's been one of the popular uh, phishing attacks that have seen either, either to get to know your uh, private information or to steal your uh, banking credentials. And uh, how do you identify those malicious apps, which, which are in fact downloaded from your uh, Play Store and people download these APKs uh, because of some phishing link, which is redirecting them and telling them to download an APK. Uh, it could also be used for identifying the cryptographic compliance of the endpoint. For example, if the endpoint is using a very old TLS stack, uh, which has vulnerabilities and it could uh, it could break the secure communication, that, that's one interesting use case that you could identify and inform the user that, hey, you're using a very old TLS stack and uh, it's susceptible to various attacks and you need to upgrade, right? Um, it also helps the um, uh, security service to get visibility into the network traffic beyond the fightable information. Uh, typically, uh, network services use uh, off-path uh, network traffic analysis to do anomaly detection. But if you want to look beyond FITUPL, uh, the source IP destination IP, source port destination port, then, then you could take the TLS fingerprint and use that even for anomaly detection. That's a very interesting use case for identifying if there is any anomalous behavior happening from endpoint devices. Uh, identifying devices is, is also a very important use case to know that what kind of device is uh, compromised and launch, is launching these attacks to identify the um, malware family which is being infected on the endpoint and to identify uh, what kind of uh, uh, um, 
uh, spread that malware had within the enterprise network to see what kind of other devices are vulnerable and, and to decide the playbook for uh, remediations. Uh, it could also help you to determine the uh, device type, make and model. It's pretty very useful for IoT devices. Uh, these device type information operating system could be displayed to the IT admin. Right, and the TLS fingerprinting. I mean, there's a lot of work happening for IoT devices. I mean, I'm pretty sure many of you are aware of uh, IoT DNS, where uh, the IoT manufacturer provides the DNS profile of an IoT device, uh, what IP addresses it should reach to, what uh, DNS uh, domains it should resolve, especially because IoT devices have a small intended purpose. And then uh, I've been working with Blake on extending this mud to uh, provide the TLS profile for IoT devices which have broad range of communications. For example, it could be your smart TV, it could be your Alexa kind of a device which, which can learn a new skill and start, start talking to new domains. How do you protect to those kind of devices? So both of them complement each other with regarding to protecting IoT devices from malware. And especially uh, if, you, if you look at consumer or, or several of the IoT devices that's running on enterprise networks, they don't have uh, a, a management utility where you can install root certificates or run an endpoint uh, uh, security service that could look for malware and uh, detect that and block that. And, and that, that, that for, for those devices, the only protection that could be offered is uh, network security. Uh, there's several work happening on uh, on TLS fingerprinting. I'm going to just touch a few of the ones that are happening uh, so that and I will give the ball to uh, Blake to go over uh, his work on what he's doing. I, I think what he's doing is probably uh, uh, the latest work with regard to the TLS fingerprinting. So SSL blacklist is, is a very popular one I'm, uh, uh, that's used. I have used it several times in my Career. Uh, it gives us two interesting databases. One is the fingerprint of the certificates used by malware. Uh, it's pretty useful that uh, if you if you're seeing any um, any TLS traffic, you just pick the certificate and compare with this database. And if you see there is a match, you know that it's it's talking to a uh, malware command and control server. Uh, since certificates are unique, that they have a unique public private key there won't be any false positives that you can easily detect and block that kind of a traffic. Uh, it also gives you another interesting fingerprint, which is the combination of all the TLS data features that it sees in TLS traffic. Uh, uh, and then it's, it's used for identifying malware, but it, it just picks that in a very naive manner that it's susceptible to false positives. Uh, if you go and look at the bowling, it, it, the, the authors of that website clearly say that it has not been tested against any good traffic and could fall, cause false positives. And I've seen that causing false positives uh, with several legitimate traffic. Uh, so um, uh, it, it has a very poor identification rate and you cannot really be sure whether it's a malware or not. Um, the one that, that's interesting from Salesforce is, uh, is uh, it's called JAM. Uh, I found it very interesting and uh, uh, one of my colleagues introduced me, it to me this uh, uh, probably a few months back. Uh, what JAM does is it starts probing the server with uh, crafted uh, TLS client hello packets with various TLS client hello parameters so that it would receive a bunch of uh, unique responses from the service. It could be with regard to the TLS versions or the cipher suits or the extensions that are supported by the client so that it, it keeps getting those unique responses. And it starts aggregating all those responses to create a JAM fingerprint. Uh, this is pretty much used by Salesforce for identifying applications, malware and domain identification. Uh, it's still susceptible to uh, false positives, I believe. I have, have not tested this or I have not seen any information on this, but I believe it's still susceptible to false positives because it does not take into any any information beyond the uh, TLS uh, fingerprint data. Uh, Salesforce had a previous release uh, called J3, which was very similar to what uh, we see with abuse. Uh, and uh, it was also used for profiling SSL and TLS clients. It was just looking at the client hello parameters and uh, figuring out the TLS fingerprinting uh, signatures. And uh, as far as I understand, it has a lot more false positives uh, compared to JAM and JAM seems to be doing a much better job because it's handcrafting those packets. It's actually probing the server to figure out what the server is doing. So, and it's figuring out, figuring out the JAM fingerprint. Um, 
what, what's happening beyond uh, using databases for identifying and uh, using um, uh, TLS fingerprinting, right? ML classification is, 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 is pretty, I mean, ML has been used for various purposes in the security industry and ML can also be used for identifying traffic. It can be used to identify malware flows, benign flows, application traffic, and even anomaly detection. Uh, so basically ML classification can take the, uh, for example, if you have a supervised ML model, um, either, either a, a deep neural network or a logistic regression or any type of model that you figured out uh, fits in you within, within the data features that you have. You can take all the TLS data features, uh, network telemetry, like the destination IP, server name that's being used, and club all of that and train your model. And uh, it, it gives you very good classification results, whether it's in a malware or a benign flow and even can help you identify the application that's being used by the endpoint. Uh, and, and and all this telemetry and analytics, if you see in the past, was uh, being run as a bad job. Now, now with all the advances in distributed systems, for example, if you use AWS Kinesis or any uh, stream processing, it's, it becomes very easy that you can you can do a near real time analytics on the telemetry network traffic that is coming from endpoints, and it could process uh, data in the scale of uh, GBPS or TBPS, and 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 it's it could identify the malware very close to the time it started launching this communication and detect that and take appropriate remediation action then then taking this action much later after the malware was detected um, it's, it's very suitable for uh, identifying zero day attacks without acting as a tls proxy and i think it, it co it's it's going to go a long way in especially providing security to iot devices mobile security home networks especially with 5g offering you virtual network services where you can host these kind of you know, security services services to protect your uh, cars, other 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 industrial IoT and other type of devices, and especially useful for enterprise devices as well. And uh, uh, the ML classification can also be enhanced by getting endpoint telemetry in case if the malware uh, tries to be really smart and tries to do adversarial attacks, where it tries to mimic the uh, TLS profile of an um, of an legitimate flow. So uh, having the endpoint telemetry clubbed with the network telemetry would give you a lot more insights on uh, what's happening on the endpoint and whether the uh, whether the uh, endpoint software is trying to lie with regard to what kind of communication it is doing, and it would help to detect those kind of adversarial attacks. Um, I mean, this is what is happening with. Uh, TLS 1.2 where uh, the ML models were typically trained by picking both uh, client hello, the entire TLS handshake parameters, which were mostly in clear text till TLS 1.2. Uh, but with uh, TLS 1.3, what's happening is that uh, for privacy reasons, uh, other than the client hello parameters, uh, all, rest all TLS handshake is encrypted. So the visibility that a middle box would get with regard to uh, uh, a TLS handshake where, for example, for instance, in TLS 1.2, uh, a middle box would see what the client client parameters were, what the server parameters were, what the server certificate was to indeed see whether the client is lying about the server it was reaching. For instance, one of the popular attacks that I've seen is client lies about the server it's trying to reach. Um, for instance, it would say in the client hello server name indicator that uh, I'm trying to reach google.com, but it would actually be going to an uh, malware command and control server. But with TLS 1.3, the biggest challenge is that the service certificate is encrypted because of the Diffie-Hellman exchange that happens between the client and server and middle boxes who are not acting as an TLS proxy don't have any visibility into whether the client is indeed talking to the intended server or it's just lying about its parameters. That's one big challenge with TLS 1.3 that uh, the TLS data features that you could extract from a TLS handshake are just reduced to uh, what you get from the client hello packet. Uh, and, and things are much changing with encrypted client hello. I mean, I see it's an experimental um, draft that's being progressed in TLS working group. Uh, it, it, it changes, it, it, it's an optional feature in TLS 1.3. It's not very clear how many whether browsers will make it mandatory and whether content providers will start supporting that. But that's one feature where you will see that uh, uh, even the client hello um, packet will be encrypted and for example the, the domain name or the ALPN or or the um, or some of the other uh, critical parameters that's typically used for TLS fingerprinting could get encrypted in the um, uh, client hello inner packet so the idea is basically the keys for encrypting the uh, client hello inner would come in 
the DNS exchange, which 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 has to happen over an encrypted session, either over DOT or DOH, and then uh, which which further diminishes the visibility of a middle box to look into what the client hello packet itself, right? And that's one of the biggest challenges that I think as an industry that we have to figure out how do we handle that kind of an scenario where legitimate and malware app starts using that, and how do you detect and uh, block uh, malicious uh, uh, software on the endpoint using these kind of uh, censorship technologies for evading detection by middle boxes. Uh, and, and I see, I mean, um, uh, Blake is gonna talk about his papers and the work he's doing on that. I'm not gonna go into detail, but uh, 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 the proposals I see he has would work for uh, both TLS 1.3 and and and, uh, and I'm pretty sure he's gonna give a lot more details on how he has developed mechanisms for that to work. And uh, uh, I'll stop my presentation here and um, ask for any questions and answers and then um, Blake can start his presentation. Thanks, Tiro. Yeah, so everyone, please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, until then, uh, I had one question, Tiro. Uh, sure. The, uh, J, uh, the JAR3 library from Salesforce, which you mentioned about uh, in a couple in the slide before. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not wrong, uh, there was also a library, which is an extension to this, which was called as JAR3S, which was possibly trying to also consider the server hello message for fingerprint yes yeah uh, can you throw some light on i mean how how much useful is uh, the i mean in brief about the server hello fingerprinting yeah the server hello is, is pretty useful uh, i i purposefully did not mention that because uh, with tls 1.3 you would not be able to see the server uh, side of the messages right so uh, it's pretty useful till TLS 1.2 that you could use for use it for any uh, communication where TLS 1.2 is, is being used, and it's it's definitely better than GA3, and uh, uh, and uh, I don't see a reason why it should not be used. But with TLS 1.3, uh, uh, I would rather pick uh, JAM than uh, GA3, GA3 yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So I can see a question there for you, Tiru. I'll read it out. Um, sure. So the question is, other than SNI, what are the parameters in TLS fingerprint that can be used for application detection? Yeah, see, uh, SNI is, is a very obvious parameter. And like I was saying that SNI could be easily spoofed by the client. You could just you could look at various other parameters like the TLS version being used, the cipher suits that are being offered by the client, the signature algorithms that are being supported by the client, the extensions that are being supported by the client. So the various other parameters that you see a client sending to the server saying that this is my TLS profile. Uh, that I support and uh, I want to establish a communication with you. And that's the profile that you could uh, use to identify the app that's being used on the endpoint or even identify malware. So it's much beyond SNI. All right. So uh, do we have any further questions for Tiru in this regard? I'll just wait for a few seconds. Okay, um, I see no questions, but in case there are any questions, uh, Tiru, I think we can take sure. it in the Q&A session. Yeah, Th thanks, sure. a lot. thanks a lot, Tiru, for the excellent presentation. Hey, thanks. So moving forward, uh, let's um, go ahead and uh, get started with our next speaker. So we have uh, with us um, Blake Anderson. I'll just take a moment and uh, give a brief introduction to the work that has been done uh, by Blake. So Blake Anderson is currently working as a senior technical leader in Cisco's cloud and network security group. Uh, he has participated in and led projects aimed at encrypted network traffic analysis, which has resulted in open source projects, academic publications and patents. He and his collaborators published the initial research that eventually became Cisco's encrypted traffic analytics ETA solution. Uh, and before Cisco, Blake received his PhD in machine learning security from University of New Mexico and has worked at the National Laboratory as a staff scientist. Blake, take it over. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, great introduction. Yeah. And um, yeah, th thank you, Tiru. That was 
a really good presentation. All right, share. Yes. All right, I think I'm sharing. Yes. Okay. Um, so I will be talking about um, encrypted traffic fingerprinting with destination context and kind of dovetailing off a lot of the concepts that Tiru brought up. Um, a brief overview of kind of what I'm going to talk about. I have four broad sections. The, the first one is, um, and I, hopefully I won't get a little too ahead of myself, but I'm going to talk about our open source software, uh, Mercury, which is what we use for data collection and analysis. And it's the, the software we're currently using to generate TLS fingerprints and, and do the actual TLS fingerprinting. Um, so after I go over the software, I'm going to talk about the actual technique that, that we use for TLS fingerprinting. Um, and that's TLS fingerprinting with destination context. Uh, and then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about two topics that I, I personally find interesting. Uh, the first being um, Quick, which I think was just published as an RFC earlier this week, um, and the applicability of TLS fingerprinting techniques to Quick. And, and then I'm going to uh, touch on some threat hunting with Mercury that kind of fits really well with some of the issues that uh, Tiru brought up. OK, so starting out, Mercury, um, we had a previous open source package called Joy. And one of the issues that we ran into with Joy was that it didn't scale to um, high bandwidth networks. So when we when we started developing Mercury, the big goal was to be able to, um, you know, collect data and do analysis on a, a 40 gigabit per second link without any packet loss. Um, and so a lot of the design decisions were specifically made to accomplish that goal. Um, it can either uh, produce JSON or PCAP output. So, you know, if you're a data scientist and, and you're trying to get a lot of data into, you know, Spark or some other big data solution, JSON's a really great output format. Um, probably the most applicable thing for this talk is that we can extract fingerprints. So, so Mercury can extract TLS fingerprints, um, HTTP fingerprints, quick fingerprints, uh, several different protocols. So we can do all of that. And then there is also an analysis component to Mercury where you can do process and operating system identification. So you get some of those um, tools for free. Um, and then there, there are some other capabilities like certificate analysis. So we can go through and um, basically do a crypto audit on the certificate. And finally, the, uh, you know, the code base is, is all C, C++ for performance reasons. But we are in the process of developing a more extensive set of Python bindings. So we're using Cython. Um, so if you're more comfortable with Python, you know, the goal is to be able to um, allow you to access all of the Mercury functionality through, uh, through Python. So, uh, you know, really briefly, so I, I didn't write this uh, code, but just to give you um, a quick overview, we used Linux's native networking. So AF packet, T packet V3, um, which is a, a zero copy, um, really efficient way to, to analyze uh, network traffic. And we have a set of ring buffers. So we have a ring buffer, packets get sent, um, each thread analyzes the packet. And then after, um, you know, analysis, which includes extracting the fingerprint and doing process identification, uh, that gets sent to um, an aggregator that will then write all of the, the data out to the, the JSON uh, file. And then we, we do some other work to get that into our big data solution. Um, so this is what the, the output looks like, um, you know, definitely with respect to uh, TLS fingerprinting. Um, you know, we obviously also report things like the five tuple and timestamp. 
Um, but for fingerprinting, we we give the TLS fingerprint, and like Tiru was you know saying in the Q and A, uh, our TLS fingerprint is uh, a string representation where uh, each of the parts are kind of delineated by parentheses. So we we extract the hex representation of the client hello, uh, you know, the TLS version, and then we ex uh, extract the hex representation of the offered cipher suites. Um, and then we also extract the um, TLS extensions, where for some of the extension data, we actually remove, um, you know, remove it. So for the TLS server name, uh, we actually don't include that in the actual fingerprint. Um, and, and our view on that is, you know, if the extension has to do with the client processes um, configuration, then we want to put that into the fingerprint. But if the extension data has to do with the server that the client is talking to, we want to extract that out um, because our, our TLS fingerprint is very much constructed to identify the, the client process that created the connection. Um, that being said, Mercury also does report uh, TLS metadata. So things like the server name would be reported in the JSON record. It's just not included in the fingerprint. Um, and then Mercury uh, creates this analysis object where we have a number of different fields. The Probably the most interesting two are the, the top where we identify the process. So we said this is you know, Cisco WebEx uh, based on the, the algorithm that I'll go over in the next section. Um, we also give it a score. So you know, it's not, we're not just saying, oh, this is Cisco WebEx, trust us. We're, we're giving it a score to um, you know, how reasonably sure are we that this is actually Cisco WebEx. Uh, and then for the malware uh, point of view, we also have some, a binary indicator that says, is this malware or not? And then we have a probability of, of it being malware. And I think that's an important point for our analysis system um, in the sense that everything is framed as process identification. So there's, there's no delineation between, is this a malware process or a benign process? It's just process identification. And then on the back end, we look up whether that identified process was, uh, was malware. It kind of keeps it simpler. Another um, interesting feature, I think, is randomized fingerprints. And and T. Ru was mentioning this, where you know a lot of uh, you know a lot of threat actors are going to try to find ways to circumvent TLS fingerprinting. And one of the most obvious ways is to randomize your fingerprint. And you know, there's I don't I don't even know anymore three to four hundred. Uh, unique cipher suites. So that gives you a lot of uh, room to, to create unique fingerprints that have never been seen before. And there's a, there's a lot of clients that, that do exactly that. Um, you know, the way that Mercury handles randomized fingerprints is that we, we keep a list of every fingerprint we've ever seen. Um, and so while you're running Mercury, it's also accumulating additional fingerprints. And then if we ever see a fingerprint that we've never seen, we'll flag it as randomized. You know, if we see that same fingerprint again, it won't be flagged as randomized. Um, this is just a, a nice accounting method to, to get at whether this, this fingerprint was potentially randomized or not. Um, and then this is the last slide on Mercury. Uh, th there are a number of different protocols. Um, and the techniques that I'm talking about for TLS fingerprinting, they're, they're equally applicable to all of these other protocols. And, and we've done various experiments on, on how well it works, but you know, to give you a, a brief idea, you know, we can handle TLS, quick, HTTP, SSH, um, obviously D, DTL, DTLS, uh, TCP and DHCP. And then for a, a larger set of uh, protocols, Mercury can extract um, interesting metadata. And I think the, the only difference there is DNS. So we don't we don't create a DNS fingerprint, but we do um, report the the responses and, and requests in DNS. All right. So now getting in the into the the meat of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start by contrasting 
what people have typically done with TLS fingerprinting uh, with what we're, we're proposing to do going forward. So in, in previous approaches, you're gonna observe a TLS client hello. You're gonna extract the TLS fingerprint string that's made up of the, the version, the offered cipher suites and the extensions. Um, and then you're gonna look up that fingerprint string in, in some database. And a lot of the times, I, I think there's just an assumption that this TLS fingerprint database exists. There are a couple of open source databases, including the one that we put out. Uh, but if you're if you're only looking at the TLS fingerprint string, you're you kind of have a problem in the sense that you don't have any way to disambiguate all of the processes that map to that same fingerprint string. So you're left with um, either selecting the the only process that you know about, or selecting the the process that you've seen most often use the TLS fingerprint string. Uh, but in any case, you know with just the fingerprint string. You, you don't have a lot of information to go off of. Um, and, and that's a really big problem if you're trying to do high efficacy uh, process identification, or if you're trying to do malware identification. And I was really happy to see Tiru um, put that quote from abuse.ch on your slide, because they're, they're actually very explicit about it, where you know, they haven't tested the false positives. Um, so you know they can't really give you an idea of like how many false positives you'll get. Uh, in the in the past, we actually looked at that, um, and for the majority of the TLS fingerprints that we uh, reverse engineered from the abuse.ch site, we we got a, a unacceptably large number of false positives, and and the majority of them were associated with TLS libraries like S Channel, um, which is uh, Microsoft's you know default TLS library. And uh, you know, there's a couple of interesting things. There's a large number of processes that will that will use an S-channel TLS fingerprint, um, in the you know on the order of thousands of unique processes. And then from the malware point of view, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the sandbox services that that you can use are going to you know detonate a malware sample in a Windows virtual machine. The Windows Virtual Machine will typically be a little bit older, so it would be something like Windows 7 or Windows, you know, an earlier version of Windows 10. Um, when when that happens, when you collect the the network traffic and you do TLS fingerprinting and you try to say, oh, though this is, you know, this is the TLS fingerprint that I that I found and it's associated with malware. Apply that on, you know, your own network. You're more likely to find older versions of Windows. Uh, you know, compared to actually finding malware. And this is the problem that, that we were really trying to tackle. Um, and so what we, what we ended up doing was, uh, you know, kind of starting from zero and saying that, you know, we need a much better data collection infrastructure to, to be able to solve this problem. And, um, you know, we, you know, like XDR is the, the big craze. So uh, it's kind of natural that we wanted to, to create a data set where we were able to fuse the endpoint ground truth with uh, the interesting network data, uh, like the TLS fingerprint. And so we, we set up network monitoring points at a, at a bunch of different sites where we were able to run Mercury, collect the TLS fingerprint data and the, the TLS server name and the, the interesting thing is at those at the sites that we're doing the network monitoring, we're also able to um, get the endpoint ground truth. So, you know, we use the AnyConnect network visibility module. Um, I think I've, I've seen other people use things like OS query, um, but the, the point is from the, from the endpoints, we wanna get information that we can correlate with the network data so that we can, um, create very detailed records to build our fingerprint database. Uh, right, so this is what the, the merged records look like. So after we've done the, the data fusion between the network data and the endpoint data, um, and just to kind of break it down, we have the network five tuple and timestamp, and this is what we 
you know, these are the keys that we use to fuse the two data sets so that they appear in both. Um, we have the TLS fingerprint string and the server name, and this is the, the data that Mercury provides us. Um, and finally, we have the endpoint ground truth. And so here we have things like the process name, the SHA-256 of the you know, process executable, and the operating system. So the operating system version and addition. And so this gives us all of the information that we need to be able to solve some of these more complex problems about you know, accurate process identification, operating system identification. Um, so with all of those merged records, uh, we end up creating a database where each line in the, in the database is a JSON um, object uh, that corresponds to a unique TLS fingerprint string. So, um, you know, in this example, we have uh, this fingerprint string. Um, we collect some metadata about uh, how often we've seen this in the wild. So, you know, we've seen this fingerprint string 10,000 times on our network. And then the, the, the really interesting thing here is that we make it very explicit that multiple processes map to the same fingerprint string. So we have a list of every process that we've seen um, using a specific TLS fingerprint string. And for each process, we collect some metadata. So in this example, the count 5,000. So half of the times that we've seen this fingerprint string, it was associated with Chrome. Um, and then we, also get the destination information. So we have a list of all of the IP addresses, the ports and the TLS server names that that process went to while using the, the TLS fingerprint string. So this gives us a lot of um, really interesting information about the behavior of these applications, both with respect to the TLS fingerprint strings that they use and the destinations that they're going to. So to give you a, a kind of a, to highlight some of the, the data collection and like what we're seeing, um, when we build a database, we build it based on the previous 30 days of traffic. Um, and we did some experiments where we found that if we, if we don't age out data, the performance actually starts to decrease. And so we age out data that's older than 30 days, but within, within a 30 day window, um, the database typically has around 40 billion TLS sessions represented in it. So uh, a good amount of, of variety. The, the number of TLS fingerprints that we have um, with endpoint ground truth, it, it varies, but it's between three to 4,000 unique TLS fingerprints. And um, so the, the process families that we have, and so these are, um, What's an, what's an example of a process family? So you know, process families in our terminology are executables that share the same code base and have similar functionality. So a process family would be Chromium web-based browsers, and that would encompass things like Chrome, uh, you know, Microsoft's Edge now, uh, Brave, Opera, um, et cetera. So we have about 5,000 of those. So pretty good representation. And then uh, in total, there's a little over 100,000 unique process hashes. Um, and all of this data is uh, collected from around 150 different unique um, operating systems. So it's, it's on the order of 80,000 endpoints, but 80,000 endpoints are running about 150 unique operating systems. And those are primarily uh, Mac OS, Windows and Linux. Okay, so yeah, now I wanna go over our um, classification strategy. So we decided to use Naive Bayes, which is probably the, the simplest algorithm that you could use and still you know, legitimately say it's, it's machine learning. Um, but we, we selected this method because we wanted to leverage all of the data in the fingerprint database, uh, you know, the empirical probabilities that we get from the fingerprint database in a way to you know, solve the, the classification problem. 
And you know, if we if we have a database entry, so for a given fingerprint, you know, we have the processes and we have all the destinations they go to, we can basically unroll that into a table that looks like what's on this slide. So we can see, you know, the destination IP address, the destination port, the the server name, and you know, the class. And class is a little bit ambiguous, but you know, in the in the actual TLS fingerprinting system, class is the process name. In this example, we're just going to do a, a binary classification malware, uh, malware or benign. And so, with with naive Bayes, um, what we're what we're trying to solve for is the the probability of a class given the destination context. Where for us, the destination context is the destination IP address, the destination port, and the TLS server name. And what we do is use uh, uh, Bayes' theorem and uh, the naive Bayes' assumption. So we, we assume that all of these things are con conditionally independent um, and we end up with the equation on the right. And I'll, I'll kind of step through this. So the, the P of M um, in, the, in the top bucket, uh, that's the, the probability of being malicious. So it's the prior probability that one of these processes is malicious. And we get that by just looking at the class labels. So the, the fourth column. And we see before seeing any destination information for this given fingerprint string, the, the prior probability of being malicious is two fifths because we've seen two malware observations and three benign observations. Um, and then we, we start computing the the conditional probabilities, uh, you know, the probability of seeing a destination IP address, given that we we know that the process is malware, and um, kind of to walk through this, we can let, let's assume that we see the first row in the wild, and so we see the 8.8.8.8 IP address. So the the probability of that IP address given malware is um, a half because we've seen it once with malware and we've seen it once with benign. Um, and then for the, the destination port, the probability of um, seeing port 443 with malware is a third because given the, given the table, we've seen uh, the destination port 443 once with malware and twice with, with benign. And we basically just keep uh, going through this exercise until you know, we compute all the probabilities, we do it for the benign class as well, and then we, we simply return the, the class with the highest probability. Okay, so to, to put together the, the whole system, um, it's kind of repeating myself, but we initially see a TLS client hello, um, we extract the TLS fingerprint string um, with the TLS fingerprint string, we look that up in our database and we report a list of probable processes. So we don't know which process it is yet, but we, we've narrowed down the you know, universe of processes to these processes that use a fingerprint string. Uh, from the, the TLS client hello, we also extract the, the destination context that we want. And so this is the destination IP address, destination port, and the, the TLS server name. And then finally, the you know we have a relatively simplistic algorithm that you know takes in the the probable process list and the destination context, and then it iterates over all of the processes in that process list, um, and for each process computes the probability of that process given the destination context uh, using the naive Bayes algorithm, um, and then we we can simply return the the most uh, probable process. So we just return the max uh, probability score. Okay, so that is the, the brief overview of how we do TLS fingerprinting. And there's, there's some caveats, like how we actually do it in the system is a little more generic. And, and one, of the, one of the things that I'll bring up right here is that we we define um, equivalence classes on all of the destination features, so the the algorithm stays 
the same, except that we add some probabilities when we're when we're doing the computation. So um, a really easy example is the destination IP address. We also map that to the autonomous system, um, and you know we compute the probability of the given autonomous system uh, given whether it's uh, you know, given the process name. And, and the idea there is that we want to generalize some of these results. So, you know, seeing a, a destination IP address that you've never seen before, you know, happens you know, relatively often. Um, but if, if a process goes to a particular autonomous system, like it's always going to Microsoft, uh, we want to encode that information and we want to generalize a, a little bit from some of these, um, you know, more specific features. All right, so that was that was the overview. Now I'm going to quickly talk about the applicability of these techniques to um, to Quick. And I'm I am not a Quick expert. I've I've written a couple of Quick parsers, um, and I, I have a functional knowledge, but not a very deep knowledge. Um, but in my simplistic view of how how Quick works, at least the the pieces that I care about. Uh, the, the session is going to start out by exchanging two crypto frames. Um, in each one of those crypto frames, if we if we decrypt um, the initial packets, which uh, which any passive passive observer can can do because they're only encrypted with a, a static initial salt that's dependent on the quick version. Um, but once we once we decrypt that, we end up with the TLS 1.3 client hello and the TLS 1.3 server hello. And so after that, you know, after that initial decryption, we basically end up in the same situation that we're in with TLS, uh, TLS fingerprinting. And you know, to give you an idea of what uh, a quick packet looks like um, after Mercury's processed it, you know, we have Again, a very similar fingerprint string. So it says quick, but um, you know, for the most part, it's exactly the same as a TLS 1.3 um, TLS fingerprint. So we, we have the same version. You know, there's the set of cipher suites and then the extensions. Um, for the for the metadata that we report for quick, so we report um, the TLS server name. We also report the the data that's contained in the Quick Transport Parameters extension. So this is a new extension for for TLS that Quick added, and in the in the next slide, I'll I'll show you some interesting things that we that we found in that in that extension. Um, and then for for bookkeeping reasons, we report other metadata about the uh, Quick connection, like the version that it's using, um, the connection IDs, and um, the data. And the the data is the data is interesting because, like I was like I was saying earlier, the initial salt that you need to decrypt the packet to extract the TLS fingerprint um, is dependent on the version. And I think one of the design goals of Quick is to to update versions on a semi regular cadence. And with each version, they uh, they want to change the initial salt. So there's Presumably, going to be cases where we're trying to decrypt a quick packet, but we we see a version that we don't know. We don't know the salt, and so for for those type of cases, we we report all of the all of the data, all of the data that we would need to actually decrypt it. And so this allows us to um, you know build up a repository of versions that we don't know about the you know the initial salts that we don't know about. And, and all of the data. So we can do some kind of retrospective analysis and, and go back and decrypt them once we've figured out that initial salt. To give you, to give you an idea of what, what we're currently seeing uh, with the deployment of IETF's version of QUIC, um, I, I think a lot of these trends are, are somewhat similar to, to how we saw TLS 1.3 being deployed, um, you know, back in 2017, early 2018. Um, in terms of prevalence, we we see quick about one five hundredth 
um, is you know it's one five hundredth as prevalent as TLS, so it's a relatively small uh, percentage of the of the traffic that we're observing. Um, but I think you know definitely myself and and I think others would be included in this. Uh, we're we're expecting it to grow pretty quickly over the next over the next six to twelve months. Uh, you know just given some of the efficiency gains that it that it provides. Um, and kind of juxtaposing the the amount, you know, the, the the diversity of processes that we see using TLS, which is on the order of you know five thousand um, on any given thirty day period, at least five thousand. Uh, there's been relatively little support for quick in the wild. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen four main processes that have been using various quick draft versions. Um, you know, Chromium and Firefox are both, uh, you know, both supporting, you know, some version of Quick in some capacity. Um, both of those uh, versions, if you look at the application layer protocol uh, negotiation extension, um, the, the application layer protocol is HTTP3, which is what you would expect. Um, when we were looking at this, the we also found two other um, processes that were using draft versions of Quick. Uh, one of them was SyncThing, which is uh, kind of a, a file file sharing um, file sharing process, and its application layer protocol was uh, BEP, which I think is a custom protocol, uh, the block exchange protocol. So that's what it's using to do the file sharing, and then IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system, and and the application layer protocol there is libp2p. Um, there are some there are some mobile applications that aren't listed on this slide. Things like Facebook Messenger uh, that use um, custom Quick Draft versions, so they have their own Quick Draft version. Uh, but I think, given our limited uh, mobile uh, data, uh, it didn't show up in our data fusion. The Oh, right. So the last thing is the quick transport parameters extension. So this is a, a new extension that's that was added in, um, you know, added by quick to TLS. It's very interesting. There's there's a number of different parameters in there. It's it's basically an extension list within the extension. Um, but one of the one of the parameters uh, is a user agent, and you know, I I think this is. Kind of interesting. I don't know if this is the long-term intention of uh, the Quick developers, but definitely for the case of Chromium-based browsers, they'll um, insert uh, a user agent in the initial packet. And and keep in mind that while the initial packet is encrypted, it can be decrypted by any passive observer. So any passive observer can actually decrypt this traffic and extract the the user agent, and the user agents provide a ton of useful information. So we get the exact version of Chrome, uh, we get the operating system, um, we potentially could get other information, um, you know, based on how the, the user agent is um, constructed. Okay, so the the last thing that I'm going to talk about um, is threat hunting with with Mercury and I'm just going to talk about one very specific use case, uh, and this is something that uh, Tiru actually uh, mentioned in in his presentation. Um, and I'll I'll briefly explain kind of what I was was doing to to find this. And I, I think it's super interesting, um, but I was I was looking at IP addresses. And looking at all of the domain names that that map to a specific IP address, and for for most IP addresses, you'll get you know pretty pretty wide diversity. Um, you know, if you look at things going to Cloudflare or Fastly, you'll have an IP address that's hosting many different domains, um, which is kind of natural for their for their business model. Um, the one thing that stood out to me is that I found a set of IP addresses that um, a number of different TLS server names map to, and they were they were server names that I wouldn't expect uh, 
to share the same IP address. So I, I don't expect Google and Netflix and Twitter and Amazon to all map to the, the same IP address. Um, but that's what I was, that's what I was seeing. Um, and I, I looked into that a little bit further and it was actually super interesting. So um, there, there were cases of malware mimicking TLS um, in the sense that this, uh, you know, as far as far as I know, this is this is not a legitimate TLS client hello, um, and I'll show the server hello in just a second. But um, and and there's there's a couple of giveaways besides the the IP address mapping to like Netflix, which Netflix doesn't use that IP address. Um, but if you look at the TLS fingerprint, uh, two things pop out. First, it it showed up as a randomized fingerprint, so it's a fingerprint we've never seen before. And then when you look at the actual um, cipher suites that the client is offering, um, they're mostly nonsensical. So it's a, it looks more or less like a random string of, of bytes. Um, they don't map to any IANA defined cipher suites. They don't map to, you know, they, um, you know, any other cipher suites that are maybe not IANA defined, but still used in the wild. Um, so that was, that was a really strange uh, piece of information that we that we found, um, but it, but it got even stranger. So uh, when we when we looked at the server's response, the the interesting thing was that the selected cipher suite, um, so the cipher suite that the the server chose to encrypt the session with, um, actually didn't appear in the client's offer list. Uh, so. You know, it wasn't that they were using, you know, custom weird cipher suites. It was, you know, they were making up things and then the server responded with a nonsensical cipher suite. So that was, again, another um, kind of giveaway that this isn't real TLS. Um, and the, the final giveaway was that the certificate that um, the server sent back, it was, um, at one point in time, it was a real Netflix certificate. Um, but it was no longer valid. So, you know, it seemed like they did a packet capture, you know, sometime last year, they collected the Netflix certificate and said, oh, we can hide by, you know, just serving this certificate. So it's, you know, it's not a real certificate anymore. It's not valid. Um, but if people aren't looking too closely, then it's, it's going to look, uh, it's going to look like a, a Netflix certificate, which again goes, you know, Gives you some support, like you need to actually be doing this type of certificate analysis. You need to be looking for certificates that are out of their validity range. You need to, you know, give some more, you know, additional scrutiny to to self signed certificates, especially how easy it is now to get, you know, real certificates from things like Let's Encrypt. All right, so yeah, that was um, that was the the presentation. Um, you know, like like Tiru had these on his slide too. So the, these are the the two papers that go into a lot more detail. The the accurate TLS fingerprinting using destination context and knowledge bases uh, will give you a much. Uh, it goes into a lot more depth about the actual process that we use to collect data and and do the TLS fingerprinting. So that's a really good resource if you're interested um, in how we're actually doing that. And then. Um, we have the, the Mercury source code on, on GitHub, Cisco slash Mercury. And again, that's a really good uh, resource for how we're doing things like collecting TLS fingerprints, uh, collecting quick fingerprints, um, and how we're doing the online analysis. Um, and there's an, there's an open source fingerprint database in that repository. Um, we had to strip out a lot of information relative to the internal database. Uh, to, to get approval to release it. Um, but it, it still does have a, a large number of fingerprints. It has a large number of interesting um, benign applications that, that you can use to, to test the system. Um, so that's, I think that's it. Thanks, Blake. Um, so, uh, all the participants, kindly please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, until then, I had a couple of questions, uh, Blake, uh, that's particularly related to the uh, quick 
support in Mercury. So uh, the open source repository, which you mentioned towards the end of the presentation, um, uh, does it also have uh, the support for Quick? Yes. Okay. It, it, and, it has. Uh... The, well, let me let me clarify. Clarify. So it, it um, mm -hmm. supports uh, some of the draft versions. We've we've done a, a little bit of internal development to to recognize uh, one of the Facebook draft versions and um, you know the actual RFC version, um, and we need to push that to the public repo. Um, so it it does extract the data. It doesn't do process identification. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting a little bit until we see a uh, larger diversity of um, of quick processes before I do that. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And uh, a follow-up question on that, and then we have one more question in the Q&A. So uh, currently the implementation uh, that you support in Mercury is for the ITF version or, of Quick, or do you also support the other versions of Quick that exist? So, so right now, it's only the IETF version. Um, we did have, so we, we do have some, it's not well tested code, but it is code that can extract like the Q50, you know, version of G Quick. Um, but not the older versions of, of Google's Quick protocol. Okay, all right. So let me put forward the uh, question that we have in the Q&A. So the question is that while carrying out classification using the NAV base algorithm, how was labeling done given the large amount of records? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So all of the, the labeling, um, can I share my screen real quick? Oh yeah, sure. You can do that. Great, thank you. Um, so it's it's basically this is where we get all our labels from. So we we have the uh, the automated and continuous data collection where we're getting endpoint records and and we're getting the the mercury data, and we we end up with, um, you know, billions of records that that look like this. And when we go to try to, um, you know, test the efficacy of the system, um, you know, there's there's two pieces. So we have, um, you know, we'll take you know a given month, like say April, we'll construct a fingerprint database based on all of this information, uh, where we have the ground truth, and then. When, when we want to understand how well is this going to do, we'll take data from May or June or you know some other month uh, that we didn't train on, and we'll run all of these records through the classifier. So we ha we have the TLS fingerprint string, we have the you know server name, we have the you know, IP address and port, we have all the information that we need to classify the session, and so we'll run that through the naive base classifier, and you know if it returns you know this is Chrome.exe, we we know we're right because we have that endpoint ground truth. Uh, if it returns something else, then, then we know it's wrong. And so that, that's pretty much our, um, our methodology to determine like how well we're, we're doing. All right, so thanks for that. Uh, do we have any subsequent questions from the participants in this regard? Um, yeah, there is one question I can read out for you. In fact, there are two. So let me take the first one. Uh, it says, uh, I'm curious if noise protocol is suitable for fingerprinting. Um, I, I honestly, I have not looked into that. If, if you have, um, yeah, send me an email. You know, if, if, if I could get a, a PCAP, um, I would, I would be able to very quickly say, you know, this makes sense to fingerprint or this doesn't make sense to fingerprint. Uh, it might take a little bit longer to get it implemented in Mercury and do a, you know, large scale measurement studies. Um, but I, I would be interested in looking at that. 
Okay, right. Uh, let's move to the next question. Uh, how can we apply these fingerprinting methods to detect threats in FinTech endpoints like swiping machines, POS, et cetera? And how would the threats be different compared to the typical endpoints? That, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I think, so uh, let me say this, like with the, the malware detection system that we, that we currently have, um, you know, it's fueled by malware, um, malware sandboxes. So uh, detecting things coming from, you know, common Windows platforms or, or Mac OS or, or even Android, um, all of that's uh, relatively straightforward because the path to data collection is relatively straightforward. Um, some of those other, you know, some of these other devices, like the more esoteric uh, IoT devices and things like that, it, it, there, there might be a challenge to, to collecting the, the ground truth. I think um, probably the best answer to that system is what T. Ru mentioned at the end of his presentation about incorporating like TLS fingerprinting information and certificate information into MUD profiles, and and that's a a much that's a much nicer formulation in the sense that for a lot of those types of devices we want to expect a lot of diversity. So enforcing the MUD profiles would, would make a lot of sense. All right. Do we have a follow-up question in this regard? Maybe we can take one more. Yeah, so, hey. sorry if I didn't answer what the question was. <laughs> hey, Blake, I had a, have a question. Uh, this is regarding uh, using Navebase, right? I mean, I mean, did you compare this with other uh, ML techniques and evaluate whether you're getting uh, better precision F1 scores? And uh, uh, and did you do? I, I didn't see any such details in the paper, the latest paper that you had published. Or maybe I missed that. So you you didn't miss it. Um, so we we haven't we haven't done that. The let me let me let me see. There's there's a couple of answers to that. It's a, it's actually pretty difficult to to formulate another algorithm that would um, would be comparable. And I, I guess the the sense is we we have this really big database that encompasses all of these empirical probabilities. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of limits us in you know some of the techniques that we could use. Um, just in terms of efficiency. So it, it would, okay. it, so I, I guess the answer is um, it's not entirely straightforward, but it's something I should probably do. Okay. I have one question on, on one of the examples that you demonstrated with Navebase, right? The one with the, uh, with the columns with the data, right? Yeah. So for this one, did you do any experiment on, let's imagine, with browsers and operating systems using a DOH and then uh, uh, the middle box not having visibility into the DNS traffic? And then how would this even work that now that you would see the a dot a dot a being used for resolving both malware domains and uh, uh, and legitimate flow domains, and then you would not even see what domains are resolved. So, uh, would in that case, how would the destination IP? Uh, you'll see them all reaching this destination IP, but then uh, how would the classification work in that case? Did, did you get any results which would demonstrate what what would what would happen in that case? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so the let me let me see the. You know, if it's if it's the case that we have, uh, you know, for a given TLS fingerprint, um, you know, we see ninety nine percent of the sessions coming from benign processes going to quad eight uh, without a TLS server name, and then we see you know one percent of the the sessions going to quad eight without a server name, and they're associated with malware. From that point of view, we're um, 
the TLS fingerprinting techniques can't really differentiate those. So from all of the information that we can get from the TLS client hello, um, it's it's not it's not going to be super applicable. Um, I think that's where you know more complicated techniques come into play where you know you look at host modeling, you look at endpoint information, you know you look at how the you know packets and links and times of the session. Um, so it would have a hard time uh, differentiating that that specific case. Um, the 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 one other thing that I'll say is we have done some experiments where we see how this system performs when we completely omit the TLS server name. Um, so we only have the the IP address and the port and Presumably, those aren't going to go completely away anytime soon. Um, but in, in that case, it takes a slight hit to performance, but nowhere near as bad. Um, it, nowhere near as bad as you would think. So it, it still performs reasonably well. And you know, I think that may, maybe the thing that's not super clear in this example is that this isn't, you know, we don't build these tables over all of the TLS sessions that we see, you know, it's segmented by fingerprint. So in cases where we lose server name information, um, but there's a lot of information in the fingerprint string, like the fingerprint string is predominantly malware, predominantly not malware, we can still get, um, we can still get reasonable results. Oh, thanks, Blake. It's good questions. Um, yeah, I have a lot more, but I'll probably shoot a mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, actually, we have one question in the Q and A, and I can see we have a couple more minutes, so maybe we can take that, Blake, if that's okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Sure. So this is a continuation of the previous question. So the question is wondering if running something like OS query on Pedroid systems, as they are called, would gather any system level information, baselining them and combining it with network analysis would help detect malicious activity on them. Absolutely. And um, at the moment, these devices are not monitored and profiled as much as they should be. That's a comment I did as well. I I completely agree with that comment. Um, I I mean every, everything. I, I completely agree. You know, OS query. Um, I've looked into it a little bit. It, I mean, it's a super powerful, uh, a super powerful tool. Um, but but you know, in general, you know. There exist solutions to do to do monitoring on Android. Uh, I think I'm not quite sure why why that's still such a, a blind spot. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I would I would say it it might have something to do with and you know Android phones specifically. Uh, there there. Are, I I think uh, people using an Android phone have a higher um, expectation of privacy than, you know, a company issued laptop. And I think that friction of, um, you know, privacy versus monitoring and, and, you know, extensive data collection, I think that kind of slows down the, the adoption, um, which, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say it's, it's a bad, a bad reason. I think everyone deserves, you know, a reasonable expectation of privacy. But I, th I think that might be one of the leading reasons why it's you know, monitoring on on mobile devices is is less pervasive in enterprise settings. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Blake, uh, for taking all the questions. Uh, I think we are at the end of the session now. So I would just like to thank uh, you, Blake, and Tiru, both of you and all the participants for taking out time for this event today. Thanks once again, everyone. Yeah, thank you all very much. Thanks for hosting. Have a great weekend ahead. Thanks, bye. Right, yeah, you too. Thanks, bye.